very different talks, um, combined several themes that somehow repeated between the talks. And I tried to highlight several, uh, some of these themes, and maybe that would open the discussion. Uh, so the first thing was, of course, the German University discussion, which for me was a bit surprising, so I, uh, I think it came back uh, Peter and Hans and Akku's talk through Hearst and also some friends from your talk like that. Um, but I think, and many people have said that before me, so it's not very original, but I think we should also bear in mind that even if we do prove some form of indeterminism, I'm not sure that that saves any form of free will, and we can now think of whether this is the folks, uh, conception of free will or otherwise, or maybe an, an empty uh, um, concept, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, but I think that most of them, maybe not most of me, when I think about free will, um, I think that being indeterministic is, is not enough. So I, I think of randomness in the brain that would make me or make someone behave in a certain manner. I'm not sure that this is what we think of when we think about free will and me having the uh, ability uh, to choose what I do. Um, so I think this is something that we should probably bear in mind. Maybe you should introduce some other concept of free will. I don't know. Um, perhaps Harry Frankfurt or others, uh, but maybe when we talk about free will, uh, focusing on the deterministic angle, um, which is very interesting and, and important, but maybe it's not enough for us when we are talking about free will. And I think the second point, which was very interesting, is the concept of randomness. So uh, we heard here about the notion of noise and randomness, and to me it was always an open question whether the thing that we call noise or randomness is only some kind of an ad hoc hypothesis since we call something noise as long as we cannot find order in it. So maybe one day we'll, we will be able to understand the mechanism of noise, we will not call it noise uh, any longer, but rather have some way to talk about it, about it or explain it, and then um, that will tell some other thing. And I think one interesting point made by Hans was whether this is actually a bug or a feature of the system. So in a sense, uh, does this thing that we call now noise is a limitation of the system due to its uh, physical construct or the way things work, not being as clean as a computer as you put it, or otherwise, could that be actually some kind of a mechanism that drives our ability to reach uh, free choices? And again, that would entail, of course, uh, equating or, or at least uh, basing our concept of free will on determinism or indeterminism. But I think this is a, something that is very interesting and you should keep it in mind. Also, uh, in my talk tomorrow, I will speak about uh, noise following Aaron's model. And I think that whenever I say the word noise, we should always uh, try to try to make it clear for ourselves what exactly do we mean when we say noise. Um, another thing that was very evident in many of the talks is, is this a real problem or did we invent this controversy perhaps to gather ourselves in the lovely um, uh, and, and, and have something to discuss. And I think this was something that uh, was very uh, evident in Peter's talk, uh, in, in the sense that we invent the concept of but I think it's also very applicable to neuroscience. I think that uh, the moment, and Petra can look to that too, so the moment where, um, you know, where limit the subjects to uh, mark the point in time where they made the conscious decision to move or felt the conscious urge to move, might have also been the moment where this thing has been invented rather than measured. So I'm not sure, and Uri and myself have been working on it for quite some time, that there is such a moment in time where subjects actually feel a conscious urge to move. I think that when they do that, they just move. So I'm not sure that they can actually differentiate or, or pinpoint that moment in time. I think that uh, being an, exper an active experimenter, many times we ask our subjects to do things that are not very ecological, and we need to um, operationalize our terms and the phenomena that we are interested in. I'm also studying consciousness, and uh, that is very evident there too. So we want to ask questions about conscious versus unconscious processes. So we came up 
these kind of beautiful and highly elegant methodologies to create or to compare conscious versus unconscious states in the lab. But then the question is, does this type of operationalization pertain in any way to our everyday experiences of conscious versus unconscious processes? So the fact that I'm able to do something when two different images are projected to different eyes, or that I cannot, now I can somehow read words that are rendered invisible through this type of manipulation for several seconds, does that mean or entail anything about the way I unconsciously process words when I walk down the street? Because usually people don't see different images projected to each eye, or they don't see stimuli presented for 15 milliseconds like we do in the lab. And uh, this is something that I've been thinking about for quite a lot of time, trying to see if we can find more ecological ways to grow conscious versus unconscious processes, and I think this applies also to the free will uh, debate. So in science and in philosophy, could we perhaps have invented a problem that might not have existed if we looked at it from a different angle? Um, what you said about the dualistic way people talk about the brain and uh, themselves also pertains to uh, something that when I wrote uh, years ago, and I'll show you more briefly, about this differentiation between me and my brain and the personification of the brain as if this is a different subject and there is my conscious self and there is this uh, sometimes conniving brain that tries to do things against my will uh, and I'm not sure that this is warranted and I think that this is perhaps uh, some kind of, of, from a little of, of um, leftovers uh, from the dualistic way of thought that became so prominent. And in that respect, I wanted to raise another question and ask whether, so let's say, first of all, what you were asking, I think, uh, was an empirical question. You have to probe empirically, perhaps, how people think about free will in order to, to know what is the fault uh, ideology, if there is such a thing. But let's even say that this is something that was inserted into our way of thinking by philosophers. If it's still there, I'm not sure that the fact that it came from philosophers makes it in any way bushable. So this is one more thing. And then, and then to, just to finalize, I think, um, I think that, that it's very interesting how consciousness ties into this problem. Um, because a long time ago, when I was a very, uh, uh, an eager student, I didn't understand much, but today there's also a lot to understand, but then it was even less than today. Um, then, to me it seems as if the problem of free will is not about determinism and indeterminism, it was about consciousness. Because creatures that don't have consciousness, I think, would have never even raised the question of do we or do we not have free will. And I think that consciousness, again, as someone who's trying to study the empirically in the lab, is as hard or as difficult to define, some would say perhaps even harder, as free will. And I see us scientists struggling over it because we think that this is an issue that is worth pursuing, much like free will or the, uh, what seems to be a gap between the way we perceive ourselves and our decisions and the way things might work in real life. So I think um, we need to, I think we do need to try and define free will or find a definition at least if you want to do that science about it. And I think we have to do the same for consciousness. I think these are two very difficult problems. I'm not sure they would be solved in my lifetime, uh, but I think we should definitely do that. So I hope that these four themes that I raised here might uh, help, the, now help us all uh, uh, progress the, the panel, the discussion that will be now among the speakers. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, comment on this very interesting uh, the good thing about being the first to ask questions is that you can be sure you'll get in line in the sense that your question will be asked. Yes? Thanks all for all the beautiful talks. Um, so my question is for, for the panel, but probably more starts from uh, Peter's talk. So but the claim was uh, the folk do not have a concept of free will. There is no concept of free will. Um, and I was wondering what people think, whether that's, if, if you were to buy that, uh, whether that's 
something that's unique about free will when we talk about mental phenomena, or whether free will is just like very many other phenomena that we struggle with, like consciousness, but maybe even attention, memory, etc. And whether, so if, if it's true about the free will, whether you would recommend what the strategy, what the strategy were that you would recommend in de dealing with that problem. And so I guess my, my, my personal suspicion is that we won't get around in any of these cases, uh, starting from specific speculations about what we want the problem to be in a scientific context. And then by making various speculations, we can see which one of these more coherent scientific concepts maps best or prolif proliferates out into society. And I, I, you, you thought I tried to say that, that we didn't have a free or well, so, uh, well, I don't think that there is an entire free will, but so, so the, the claim was that, that the Pope has no concept of free will. There is no concept of free will. Is that the other Peter? The, that, that, the other, yes, you're talking about the other Peter, I think. Yeah. That's yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's an awfully big question. My opinion is that, that words free will are pretty close to being unique in terms of philosophically important words and phrases. Causation, existence, knowledge, consciousness. All right, they need a lot of clarification, but in that, those cases there is something to clarify. Uh, my contention is that the words in the case of the words free will, there's, in the case of a particular cons, a particular stipulated definition of the term, my own, for example, that I used in this, yes, that could stand with a lot of clarification, but, um, uh, but the words taken out of any context, unlike causation, consciousness, etc. Do you think that's really true for consciousness? I mean, lots of people think it's not. I mean, lots of people think consciousness is as hopelessly uh, a bag of different concepts that have nothing well, to do with each other. When for example, Descartes tells us that dogs and cats don't feel pain, right? So uh, that's stupid, right? Uh, there is some that they are sentient, right? They feel things. One kind of consciousness is sentience. That seems clear enough. Stones aren't sentient. There's not. You're not. If I stick a pin. Uh, into a log in the forest floor, I'm not producing a sensation in anything. So there's some kind of concept that every, some kind of something that everybody will agree with there. Anybody else want to this? So, so I just wanted to ask, uh, I so I, I want to better understand the claim. So the claim is that uh, people are misusing, because people, you know, they use the words free will, so they don't understand what they're saying when they do so, or? They use, they understand what they're saying when they use the words inside the idiom of one's own free will. He did it of his own free will. She did it of her own free will. Um, the judge asked, did you, when you performed this action, did you do it of your own free will? That means, were you coerced, threatened, or so on? That's obviously not what the word means if somebody says the limit experiments prove that no one has free will. It doesn't mean that they prove that no one is uh, ever uncoerced. Uh, I say outside, it's outside the context of that particular phrase that the words have no particular meaning. That is, they have been given particular meanings by particular users but not by refinement of something that we find in ordinary, uh, our ordinary conceptual apparatus. Okay, can I just uh, add some comments to the question how to define the free will? There was a, uh, a question before concerning the comparison of color and free will. So for color, we do, have, do not only have physical uh, correlations, but we also have clear physiological, neurophysiological correlations in the brain. And if we can find eventually some physiological correlations to the free will, which is still not possible, we may come closer to the answer in the question what it, 
what it really is. This is uh, going away from purely philosophical question, but is coming, trying to connect the philosophical issue and the everyday issue of free will with uh, something that is uh, neurophysiologically accessible. If there had never been any scientific investigation of color, color perception, and so on, it would make sense for a group of scientists to get together and say, let's investigate color. They'd know what they were talking about beforehand. Because we have this we have this system of statements like the car that left the scene of the accident was a dark green Lexus. People may agree on that. What are, what are the underlying causes of their agreement? That could be investigated. In the case of free will, there's no starting place. Okay. Let's, let's, stop here. Let's, stop, let's stop here because I think there were some other questions. Yeah, I wanted to reinforce the fourth and the first things that we had said in our general commentary. On the fourth one, I didn't understand why Peter, first Peter, or Petra, and actually some others on the panel, put the question of consciousness with the question of free will as if it was a seamless transition. It seems to me just two quite different questions, each of their own interests, but unless I'm missing something, I didn't see why they were bleeding into each other. The second is each of the panelists, except Peter Bunny Water, use determinism and its opposite on a conference on free will in the sense in which Peter Bunny Water called the manifest image using Dennis terms. Uh, namely, the scientists think there are either gaps in the knowingly sufficient laws, or there is only a probabilistic rather than a singular causal relation uh, between singular events, and think somehow that would have something to do with uh, responsibility, morally interesting stuff, human spirit, and so forth. Uh, the first of Leah's points is you might think there's a notion of freedom, not the notion of, of your own free will, perfectly good notion, but rather another notion of freedom, the one that Peter Von Inwagen ended up with as ability. So when Hume says the liberty worth wanting is actually the ability to cause through your actions the objects of your desires, that's something worth having that none of this gappy or non-gappy, no nuclear sufficient or not law stuff has anything to do with. Yes, that, that, thanks for that, and uh, I, I do agree with that, but in, in Horst's case, the point is uh, simply to say that by the, he wants to block this move, this, he wants to block this very specific move from, uh, from to, to, to neurodeterminism, and uh, he's, he's kind of, uh, I think, he just likes to leave it at that, so he says this, if this is something that worries you, and that's an if. So if this is something that worries you, that, that we have all this neuroscience and uh, you're worried that it might produce problems for, for your freedom or your moral responsibility, then he says, if you're worried about this, then don't worry about it too much. So that's the only thing that he, he, he wants, to, want, wants to say. About consciousness, and I must say that so my thought is very undeveloped about that, so maybe I'm saying things that are completely off. But to me, it seems like most of the discussion is, is like a dissociation between conscious and unconscious mechanisms. So, this is limit, this is everything, almost everything else that has been, all, almost every argument that neuroscience, at least, or psychology has made against free will has been in the scope of contrasting conscious versus unconscious processes. And, and I think that's why the two questions kind of uh, stick together. Because it, m maybe there is no point in talking about free will, but actually what people are asking is whether this conscious I and, and this identification might be erroneous identification between I and the conscious uh, experiences that I have, are, are these the ones that drive my decisions? And I think this is why the two questions are, are commonly taken up as one. That should not be Me? Uh, I'm putting a question to all of you. Um, do organizations like companies and states have free will? 
in my talk um, Tuesday, I have an example of a big company that exercises great power and shows that it has free will. I'm talking about Exxon. Well, you know my hand, sir. Since there's no concept of free will, uh, that doesn't make any sense to ask where the companies have it. So, uh, I think that's a, that's a good question. And I think, to some extent, it depends on this issue of I. So, it depends on how we see that. And I, I, I was reading this book recently, it just came out called uh, How Physics Makes Us Free. Uh, I can't remember the, the author of the book, someone here probably remembers. Jenan Ismail. Yes, that's right. So, I was reading that book and, and, and he, makes basically, he basically makes the argument that the I is uh, to some extent similar to an organization of a certain kind. That it's, uh, there are all sorts of intentions and things going around and then things surface. So, so the, 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 the intentions of an I are somehow analogous to the intentions of, of a collective. So, well, if you get that going, then you might say, well, if, you, if the I is like that and it has whatever we mean by free will, then it doesn't seem like a ludicrous idea that perhaps an organization when it reaches a certain level of kind of functional coherence or something might happen, something like that too. So, I mean, we do help, I think we hold organizations responsible for some things, right? I think we do. I mean, it's not just that we're saying all the individuals are responsible, but we think that perhaps, at least it sounds somehow plausible to think that some organization, that the U.S. Army is responsible for something. It's not just the individuals. There's something that we say when we do, when we say something like that. So, it doesn't sound... Uh, Completely weird, to me at least. Thank you. Uh, it's a question to you, comes in connection to the, uh, the latest. Uh, Could you please use the mic? Yeah. <coughs> okay. uh, it's a question to you, comes uh, in connection to the, the latest conversation here about the colors and future. Uh, we know that you know scientific functions uh, of colors. I mean, why we uh, concerning free will, what uh, neuroscience is looking at, I will talk about it more tomorrow, uh, is uh, decision making. And then you have different uh, media, different projects, which is very important as well. So this is as close as we can come uh, today. And I think, what do you think about that? Okay. And you also. Uh, <coughs> First of all, I'm very much looking forward to your talk, uh, Toro, because this is, this is exactly what, uh, what I expect from uh, examination of Sophia. Well. And I'm, I'm completely agree with, uh, with Liat about uh, this thing of consciousness. It's, it was not by chance that I said at the beginning, I will not consider consciousness, I only will focus on determinism, because it's different. It's a different issue, and I also believe that you have to, to look for conscious, uh, consciousness if you want to understand what is a free will. And I think this is what you. I hope this is what you are going to talk about. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Oh, there was another one. Yes, I wanted to respond to, to this question, and I think it also pertains a bit. Um, to you because um, Lippert actually thought um, free will was not only within the domain of consciousness and not within the domain of unconsciousness, so that is one of the explanations why it is concept. Okay, so I think we do have time for another question. <coughs> so this um, a challenge of it. Like you explained that there is no definition of free will. Uh, I, I would argue that the problem is that there's too many definitions. <laughs> floating around there, um, <laughs> confusing people. So for example, uh, some people operate under the definition that there's no external coercion and that your neural processes protect their subsequent actions. And by definition, I think that's compatible with the human being. But other people would say, and in addition, things must have had the possibility of turning out otherwise, ontologically enough, and that would be incompatible with the human being. And other people think that in addition to, say, the latter, Conscious contents have to be efficacious and subsequent acting. 
And then someone like Payne would argue, in addition, you need a sort of meta free will where we can choose to become a new kind of chooser in the future. And all these different definitions are floating around. People sometimes seem to be talking at cross purposes to, you know, uh, to me and as a neuroscientist. Uh, well, precisely. <laughs> that is just what I was saying. I'll just add that, and none of them can be said to be right. They're talking as if they were arguing. Uh, they, this was an argument in which somebody was right, uh, namely the speaker, and the people offering the other definitions were wrong. But there is nothing guiding those definitions towards the words free will. They're just different proposals about how to use those words, and nobody is right. Should we first then agree on what our terms mean, and then do it out? If we can. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we have time for one last question. Another problem is, is there a free will, or is there someone who works free? This is another question. We are substantiation, we make substantives of free will, consciousness, and so on. We have made them to think. Suppose we don't use substantives, suppose we just use phrases like act freely. Act freely. That's not a substantive. And it's a, it, someone is acting freely. There is no free act. Or is the the, is the, I would have no, I'm not making a point about abstract ontology when I said there's no free will. I mean, uh, I could just as easily have said the phrase acts freely doesn't have any agreed upon uh, meaning. Yes, it has a meaning, but uh, there's a subject, an act, and the act is qualified. There are three things. And we must see all the three things if we have this passion the three of Okay, for the panel, I think we should give them a hand.